That said, welcome to our series, The Normal Life Cycle of a Christ Carrier. We are in part 10 today. And I would ask you, as, as has been our practice, to join me in Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to look at the passage beginning in verse 13, going down to verse 15. And the scripture reads, Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, that we may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. That is the purpose of this series, to position us to grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. I have enjoyed sharing this series with you. Uh, but more than my enjoyment, I believe that this is a critical series for the Christ carrier, for the believer, for the Christian to be exposed to. It is critical. We This is one of those things that you ought to send the, the playlist to your family, to your friends, to everyone you can think of who claims to know the name of the Lord, that they can really be exposed to a truth that I'm not sure most people in the church today are aware of. Many of you, uh, we spent the last men's ministry going back over last week's message. Uh, I've talked with many of you throughout this series, and several of you have said that what you have heard in this series you have never heard before. Several of you have indicated that what you have heard in this series has answered questions that you have had all your life. Several of you have indicated that what you have heard through this series has impacted you in ways that you did not expect it would, share the love. This is a wonderful opportunity to take this message and share it with others, those who are not a part of kingdom life, that they can also understand God's plan for their growth, development, and maturity in the kingdom of God. Now, I want to pull back the curtain just a, a little bit today. I don't often give sort of a tutorial on series development and how I structure a series and how one can. This is perhaps for uh, our developing preachers who are watching today. But I want to give you some insight into how a series unfolds here at Kingdom Life and how a message goes to a series and, uh, and how I deliver it to you. It's, there's, a, there's sort of a, a format for series development that one can use. I want you to look at it and see so that you can see where we are in this series today. So very often that series uh, begins with a problem. And as you know, I use a lot of alliteration, so these are all P's. It begins with a problem, a human dilemma that is addressed by the Word of God. We need to know how we grow in the Lord and what God's plan is for us Without knowing that, we will flounder and can spend 30 years as infants not knowing we're supposed to grow up. That's the problem. That's the dilemma. And then there's a premise, and the premise is usually built out in the first message of the series. And the premise gives a context for God's perspective on the kingdom life, the plan A life. This is what it looks like. This is what we're going to deal with. And at the end of this series, this is what you're going to know. If you were in a class, it would be the objective, the learning objectives for that class. This is where we're going. This is the premise. And then we get into the presentation, usually somewhere around the second to third uh, message in the series. We get into the 
meat of the message. And this is where it gets thicker. This is usually where the messages get longer. And those messages in the presentation are filled with principles, profound, liberating truths, the promises of God that undergird whatever it is that we're teaching, pronouncements. Sometimes I will give you pronouncements and confessions like I am dunamis that you spoke over yourself through that message, and that is in the meat of the series. And very often I will give you a prayer, which as we did in this series, every believer's prayer at the end of the message so that you are inviting God in to bring this change about in your life as the meat of the message, the presentation of the series is unfolding. After we have laid out all the principles and the profound liberating truths and the promises and the pronouncements and the prayers, the last thing that I do in the message in the series is give practical application of the word, answering the question, what does it look like? And that's what we've been doing. So this, this, this past week, I shared some of that, uh, and I shared this new paradigm where you have the spiritual life at the hub. This week, we're going to answer the question, what it looks like to grow up. Next week, we're going to deal with how to grow up. And then in our final week 12, we're going to deal with how to help others grow up. So for those of you who are for the ministers in particular, there you have a, uh, a structure and a systematic way of developing series for congregations that you eventually will lead and teach and some insight into what I have done and what we are frequently doing as we develop not just the message where you know, and some of us are used to just going to a church where every Sunday was a different message. It was not a series, and one week the pastor was in Isaiah, and the next week he was in Matthew, and the next week he was in Psalms, and the next week he was in Job, and it just would kind of come and see what he's going to teach, and that's fine. And what you get from that kind of church is a lot of inspiration. You come out feeling inspired, but you cannot come out being very changed because change like the Grand Canyon that has to be worn down by the consistent flow of water over thousands of years. We need a message. That message has to hammer our soul one week, two weeks, three weeks, sometimes eight weeks, sometimes 10 weeks, sometimes 12 weeks, sometimes like dunamis, 48 weeks. It just has to keep on dripping on us so that that same message looked at from different angles and different sides, hits our souls, hits our spirits, and runs a new track in us, trains up. That, that word, train up a child in the way he should go, means to run a track in him. And that track is run as we are consistent with the message. So all of that is background. I want to get into part 10 of the normal life cycle of a Christ carrier and our subject for today is from living small to living large. From living small to living large. I, I would note that you could also say from living low to living high. But I have titled it from living small to living large. And today I want to give you, uh, I want to talk about growing up in five critical ways that really matter. Growing up in five critical ways that really matter. We are in the practical application of this series. What does it look like growing up in five critical ways that really matter? Now, before I get into that, I need to say this. What we will consider today is based on an assumption that you have received, believe, know, and are walking in the truth that has been presented regarding the normal life cycle of a Christ character. It is assumed that you are growing up in all things, that you have heard this message, that you have heard what has been taught, that you have heard everything that was shared, lesson one through eight, and that you have, a, you have heard enough to say, that's for me, 
That's for me. You have prayed those believers' prayers, and it is assumed that now you may not be grown up, but that you are growing. Wherever you are, say, I'm growing. If that's you, say, I'm growing up. Say, I'm growing up. Go ahead and indicate that. If you, you don't have to be grown up. This is not all or nothing. This is not performance-based. This is process. And once you get on the wheel, that's the beginning of transformation. And so I need you to know today, if this is my form of a message of encouragement. I need you to be encouraged that if you, are all, if you have received all of this, you received it, you believe it, you know it, and you're walking in the truth that has been presented regarding the normal life cycle of a Christ carrier, it is assumed now that you are growing up in all things. I want to tell you what that looks like. We're in the practical. I want to tell you what that looks like. It is assumed that you are or are becoming one who is submitted to the Lordship of Christ, settled in the way of the Lord, sold out to the kingdom of God, single-minded, living for the glory of God, stable, able to remain consistent under pressure, suffering, delivered from your own need for comfort, sanctified, yielded to the will of God, resisting the flesh, sendable, prepared and trustworthy, able to go for God. Those are the things that it is assumed you are or are becoming. It is also assumed that you are or are becoming one who is sighted, seeing truth as the world and the world from God's perspective, saturated, soaked in the word, and the word abiding in you, stable, able to remain consistent under pressure, settled that you have gone beyond belief to faith and trust, seasoned, possessing the, an unshakable God resume, sold out, living for the glory of God, no questions asked, satisfied that you learn to be content in all things in the Lord, share ready, fully prepared, to share the gospel. It is assumed these things, if we are going to go beyond this point, it is assumed that you are or are becoming these things. It is also assumed that you are or are becoming one who is a lifelong learner, one who is on the journey from non-Christ carrier to Christ carrier to Christ carrying disciple to disciple making disciple to disciple making disciple maker. It is assumed that each of you listening to the sound of my voice, either you are or you are becoming actively engaged as a lifelong learner on the journey toward disciple-making, disciple-maker. If these assumptions are true, then be encouraged. You have already begun growing through these five critical transitions. And this message will simply be confirmation that what is happening in your life is the Lord doing and the normal life cycle of a Christ carrier. In other words, you're where you're supposed to be. Now, I want to talk to you about growing up in five critical ways that really matter. The first way that we need to discuss that we should grow up is growing from a fact-based reality to a truth-based reality. Growing from a fact-based reality to a truth-based reality where we're no longer living based on our facts, but we are living based on our truth, and our truth, the truth, what God says about all things, who I am, who, how the world works, who he is, the truth about all things trumps the fact about anything. The truth about all things trumps the fact about anything. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, we are told that we, the children of God, Walk by faith, not by sight. We walk based upon believing that what God has said is true. We believe that God is and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Not by sight, not by the facts that are presented. We are not limited by what we see. 
we've got to answer some questions then. Three questions, in fact. The first is, what is my relationship with the Word of God? I don't want to impose upon you the relationship I have. You may not have the same relationship. You have watched me on many occasions be exposed to some truth in God's Word and turn on a dime and make a 180-degree turn. You watch me when I, when I discovered his name, Yeshua. The next Sunday, I began preaching in the, next, the name of Yeshua. You watched me last week with the eight areas. As soon as she, he showed me truth in his word, I immediately turned, and there's no more eight areas. How, what is your relationship with the word of God? Are you negotiating the word? Do you see it as truth, infallible truth, or do you see it as opinion? Like, do you think that the things that are in the Bible are something that someone else thought, but maybe or maybe not, it's, it, may be, it, may, it may or may not be for you? Do you see it as truth, or do you see it as human opinion? If you say you see it as truth, then how do you respond to it? Again, my relationship with the Word of God is very obvious to anybody watching me live my life. But the change in you is not going to happen based on the relationship I have with the Word. If it's truth, how do you respond to it? you got to ask the question, if I say it's truth, how do I respond to the Word of God? How, what do I need to see before it causes me to turn? Because sometimes we hear something, we say, man, that thing spoke to me, and we go right back to living how we were. John chapter 8, verse 31, 32, we often go here. It's very important for us to go here frequently and to understand because of the nature of the promise here, we really need to understand it. Otherwise, we'll come away thinking that something is said that is not. John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32, then Yeshua said to those Jews who believed him, first prerequisite is you must believe him. And then he said, if you abide in my word, second requirement is you must abide in his word. He said, you believe me, you abide in my word, then I recognize you are my disciples indeed. And as a result of you believing me and abiding in my word, you're going to have a relationship with the truth that is in my word. And he says, and you shall know. Know is a statement of relationship. I put in large print the Greek word there is ginosko. Gnosko is the word that is translated into English as no, and he says you're going to gnosko the truth, and gnoskoing the truth shall make you free. Gnosko means intimate, deep, engaging, personal, transforming relationship with something, and in this case, with truth. When you have gnosko, with the truth, that's when the truth makes you free. Not simply being exposed to it, not simply being able to regurgitate it, not simply being able to reiterate it, but gnosko means it has become an intimate part of my being where the truth I have is inseparable from who I am, indistinguishable from who I am, changed at the molecular level, by the truth I have, and gnosko of the truth will make me free. This is even what was talked about in the Old Testament with Joshua. This is what the father was telling Joshua when he told him how to develop a relationship with the law, the truth he had. This book of the law, he says in verse 8, Joshua 1, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. So you got to put the word in your mouth. It's not about you just hearing the word come out of my mouth. You've got to put the word in your mouth. But you shall meditate in it day and night. The process of meditation is getting the word from your mind from your mouth to your mind to your heart. So it's got to come out of your mouth so you can hear it. So it can hit your mind and then be deposited in your heart. 
And as a result of that, then you may observe to do all that is written in the word. Why? Because the word will be written on your heart. And then you will make your way prosperous. And then you will have good success. So how are you responding to the word of God? I want to tell you that if you're going to grow from fact-based based to truth-based living, you've got to receive it, you've got to believe it, you've got to know it, and you've got to walk in it. You, you heard that somewhere before, haven't you? You've got to receive it, you've got to believe it, you've got to know it, and you've got to walk in it. So the first of the critical ways that we need to grow up is from fact-based to truth-based reality. The second is that we must grow from a self-centered life to a Christ-centered life. We must grow from a self-centered life to a Christ-centered life. The biggest challenge that faces the church today is not the influence of the devil. It's not the influence of uh, the occult. It's not the, the influence of witchcraft. The biggest challenge that faces God's movement in our lives today is the influence of self. We live our lives through the filter of self. We come to church through the filter of self. We will run people over on the road trying to get to church because we're running late and we won't even recognize that we put them in harm's way because all we're thinking about is ourselves. We are, we just, we're just after, we're out for ourselves. We're living for ourselves. We're thinking about ourselves. Everything that we say is about ourselves. Everything, every time we engage people, it's about we're focused on ourselves. In our marriages, we're thinking about what's in it for me. On our jobs, we're thinking about what's in it for me. We're over everywhere we are, we are always consumed and concerned about ourselves. Even when people, most people that you would consider to be spiritual, a lot of people who are mature and knowledgeable, their whole focus is what God can do for them. That whole prosperity gospel movement is all focused on self, what you experience, what you declare over yourself, encourage yourself. There are, there's a myriad of songs that are out there that all bring you back to yourself. But if we are going to grow up in all things into him, we have got to grow out of living a self-centered life to living a Christ-centered life. This is what the Lord was speaking to his followers prophetically because they had not yet received the Spirit of Christ, so he was talking to them about following. But if we take a look at Luke chapter 9, we're going to see that he tells them what is prophetic truth for us today, even as Christ carries. Let's go in and take a look at Luke chapter 9. We're going to begin in verse 23. Luke chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. Then he said to them all, speaking of his followers, he says, if anyone desires to come after me. Now, we would understand that as walk with me. He says, what's the first thing you do? I call this walking with Christ 101. Let him deny himself. Let me tell you. You ought to print this screen out and put it on your refrigerator. So when you get up on any morning before you go in there for a glass of orange juice or some creamer or an egg or whatever you get in the morning, some milk, you see this sign. Maybe you ought to print it out and put it on the milk container and on the orange juice container so you don't get used to seeing it on the door and just open the door without looking. Let him deny himself. He says, before you do anything else, deny yourself. The enemy of Christ ruling in your life is not the devil. It's you 
just being so concerned about you. It's you being obsessed with you. It's you and I having a filter that begins and ends with us. He said, let him deny himself. And then after you deny yourself, then let him take up his cross daily and follow me. Start by denying himself, then take up his cross. The cross is what? The cross is an instrument of death. If you're going to take up your cross, not only are you going to deny yourself, but you're going to die to yourself. You're going to get up on that cross. You're going to deny yourself. You're going to die to yourself, and then you're going to follow him. He says, for whoever desires to save his life, to preserve his right to determine what happens next, to, to, pr to protect his right to express his emotions, to protect his right to express himself. Whoever desires to save his own self-expression will lose it. But whoever gives up his right to express himself, to be, to, to be about his feelings, his desires, he's, you know, I'm just into this, I'm just out of this, I'm feeling some kind of way. He said, if you give that up for my sake, in the process, you will discover what real life really looks like. So we looked at this diagram the last time where we redid our diagram, and we looked at this diagram where the spirit life, spiritual life is in the center. And I believe that is the truth for everybody. Even the person who is not born again, their spiritual life is still in the center, but, but there's nothing there. There's no activity there. There's no life there because spiritually they're dead. But, but you and I, we have a spiritual life. The question for us is not whether or not we have a spiritual life. The question for us is how healthy is my spiritual life? And that's the question that I want to bring to us today. How healthy is my spiritual life? I want you to look at this barometer here where uh, toward the top you are seeing someone with a spiritually, they are a spiritually healthy Christ carrier. And then you look down the bottom and you have somebody who's got a spiritual life, but they are an extremely carnal Christ carrier. What's the determining factor between being healthy as a Christ carrier and being unhealthy or a carnal Christ carrier? The answer is how much of yourself is influencing you. The more you are influenced by yourself, the more carnal you are as a Christ carrier. Are you a Christ carrier? Yes, you are. Are you going to heaven when you die? Yes, you are. It's not about you. The question is, are you living for God's glory? Probably not. Why? Because you're so influenced by yourself that it may, yes, you have a spiritual life, but it's so carnal, it's so mixed, it's so drawn from the filter of self that that when God looks at you, when people deal with you, they can hardly tell in many instances that Christ is even alive in you because you look just like everybody else. But the less self influences you, the less you allow your opinion, your desires, your want to to control and influence you, the healthier you become as a Christ carrier. Growing up into him, is growing out of self-influence into Christ influence. What it looks like in looking at a diagram pictorially is Christ is the center. He dominates that spiritual orb. He is the dominating influence in every area of your life. It is influenced by the presence of Christ. You are a healthy Christ carrier. The carnal Christ carrier still has Christ in the middle, but they're so dominated by self. Look, this is what they look at. Look at how dark the orb is. The light is not shining. It's muted. It's, it's all self. Everything they do it either begins or ends. It comes back to them. Everything flows through self. Every, everything God tells them to do, it has to do with how they feel about it. 
what they think about. In fact, listen, I, I want to give you, I want to help you know whether or not you are being very self-driven. And this is this is how you can know you are being very self-driven. I am likely being self-driven the more my conversations include statements like, I think, I want, I feel. The more you talk about, some people are very big as I, I just think, I think, they live out of their minds. I just think, I just think, I think, well, I don't think, I think, I think, well, I'm thinking, I've been thinking, I want. They live out of their desires. I tell you, I well, I don't want that. Oh no, I don't want to do that. I'm not. I'm not interested in that. Oh, you know what I want? I want so badly. I'm telling you, I just want to. And then there are people who live out of their feelings. Oh, I feel. I just feel like. Oh, well, you said that. I felt like. Well, I mean, it's hard. If this this feels so tar- so challenging, I don't feel like I'm up to that. I'm just not feeling that. If that's your conversation, your life is dominated by being self-driven. And the more self-driven you are in your in your life, the more likely your conversations will be based around what you think, what you want, what you feel. But it's time to grow up in all things. Growing up in five critical ways, we must grow from being not only fact-based to truth-based, not only self-centered to Christ-centered, but from self-powered to spirit-powered. Self-powered or self-empowered, either way you want to say it, to being spirit-powered, spirit-empowered. The question is, where is the source of your strength coming from? We have been taught, especially here in this nation, we have been taught to be very self-sufficient people. We think that the epitome of our self-actualization is coming to a place where we are self-sufficient. I can do it. I can get it done. It's all about self. It's about me and what I can get done, my own capability, my knowledge, my skills, my abilities. It's all about me and what I can get done. And as a result, as a people, we actually resent the idea of being God-dependent. We think that that's a sign of weakness. So what we think Christianity is, is me making a decision for Christ, because after all, I have the power to choose Christ, so I exercise my, I make a decision for Christ, And then after I make a decision for Christ, I live for Christ. And I live in such a way that I live better than the bad people, and I live better than the unrighteous people, and I live in a way that God looks at me and he says, I approve of you. I accept you because you live at such a high standard, you're okay with me. And then I pull my suspenders out and I thumb them out, I say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for choosing me. I've, been, I've done this all for you. This is, a, this is a, an illustration of how much I love you. I did it for you. And we understand the Christian life as us doing for the Lord in the hopes that in the end, he'll accept us, he'll affirm us, he'll reward us. And that is all self-righteousness. This is not about what we do for Christ. This is all about what Christ has already done for us. And any deviation from that is what Paul would call another gospel. He says, even if an angel preaches any other gospel than what Christ has done for us, let him be accursed. So that North American gospel that has taught us to make a decision for Christ and then do our best to live for him. Come on, you can do better than that. Get it together and then go to church and serve. 
All of that is another gospel. But that's not what he's called us to. He's called us to the Christ power life. You remember the diagram? That spirit-led life? The spiritual life influences every, the social, the, the spiritual, the the emotional, the intellectual, the physical, the phys every area of your life is supposed to be influenced by your spiritual connection to God. That means that the Holy Spirit, who is the, the electric, he is the power plant, and the Holy Spirit is flowing through your spirit, and your spirit is supposed to be flowing into every area of your life. You are spirit-powered. Why would you want to do it in your own strength when you can rely on the ability of God? Look, Ephesians 3.20 tells us, beginning in, in, uh, in 20 and going on in 20, 21, it says, now unto him who is able to do, look at what he can do. He can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think according to what? The power that's where? In us. How is the power in us? We have the Holy Spirit. He is the power plant. Look, to him be glory. The reason that I live a spirit-empowered life is because it gives God glory when I do things in my life that I could not do in my own strength. It's not it's nobody, God gets no glory if I do something that I can do in my own strength and I give him credit. I say it's for him. He says, I don't need it. I need you to come to a place in your life where what's before you is beyond you. And then when I take you through it and over it, everybody knows that you could only do it by the power of God at work within you. And then that's when I get glory. But we're living, we're trying to live in our own strength, and we're trying to get credit form for it when we say it's for the Lord. And that is not the gospel, and that is not the kingdom. Look with me at Galatians chapter 2, beginning in verse 19. Here Paul writes, for I, through the law, died to the law, that I might live to God. Let's back it up. What's he saying? The law represents their own effort, the Jews' effort to please God, and was supposed to teach them that they could not do it without a mediator Christ. So for through the law, through my own effort to be righteous, I died to my own effort to be righteous that I might live to God in his righteousness. And then he explains, I have been crucified with Christ so that it is no longer I who live trying to get it right in my own strength, in my own ability, but Christ lives in me. He knows how to live the kingdom life. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Meaning, the life I live in this body, I live by trusting that the Son of God is in me, living his life out. He loved me, and he gave himself for me. And then he concludes, I do not set aside the grace of God. See, I would take the grace of God and throw it in the trash if righteousness could come by any human effort. Then Christ died in vain. If I can do this, trying a little harder, working at a little more, watching a few sermons, if I could do it in my own strength and ability, then Christ didn't have to die to make me righteous. I just needed to try a little longer. And I set up aside the grace of God. But Paul says, I do not throw away the grace of God because I recognize 
that righteousness could not come through the law and Christ did not die in vain. I needed him to die for me that his spirit could be spread abroad and I could have his spirit living in me and be powered by the spirit of God. Growing up in five critical ways. Got to grow up from fact-based to truth-based reality, from Christ-centered, excuse me, from self-centered to Christ-centered life, from self-powered to a spirit-powered life, from a fallen religious Christ follower to a transformed Christ carrier. From a fallen religious Christ follower to a transformed Christ carrier. Remember that the Christ followers were before the cross. The Christ followers are those men in the gospel who did not have the spirit of Christ because the person of Christ was standing there talking to them. You and I, however, have access to the spirit of Christ because we come along after Spirit of Christ has been released, in particular after the day of Pentecost. The Spirit of Christ is released, and now you and I no longer need to, to, to try to follow the person of Christ. We get to carry the Spirit of Christ. It's very important that you not settle for being a Christ follower. You will get lost. You will be following him, you'll be following him, and the next thing you know, you're going to get lost. But if you carry him, how can you not follow one who is leading from the inside out? Look with me at, at Matthew chapter 7. This is, this is where the church often misses it, this idea of trying to follow Christ and to do those things that he says do, WWJD, what would Jesus do? It's not going to get you there. Matthew chapter 7, take a look with me, beginning in verse 22. Matthew 7, verse 22. The scripture says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, first of all, whoever's talking to him recognizes him as Lord. So these are, this is not the atheist. This is not the agnostic. This is not the person in the world. This is the person in the church. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord. And then they will say, have we not prophesied in your name? Who would be doing that? Have we not cast out demons in your name? Who would be doing that? And done many wonders in your name. Who would be doing that? We are talking about the church. And I will declare to them, excuse me, Lord, to whom? To the church, to those who are in the church organization, but not in the family of God. I will say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Why is this lawlessness? Because it is lawlessness to walk in the things of God apart from relationship with him. Apart from covenant with him. You're doing the things that a covenant people would do, but you lack the covenant. And God says, I cannot endorse what you've done because I do not know who you are. You are an effective Christ follower, but an ineffective Christ carrier. Look with me at Acts chapter 19. We've looked at this before, where we see uh, those who, have, who, who are trying to do what the church does, but they do not have the covenant that those in the church have. So here, now God, beginning Acts chapter 19, verse 11, now God worked unusual miracles or dunamis by the hands of Paul. 
so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves. So these are Jews, but they are not in covenant with God through Christ. And so they take it upon themselves, which is the, the epitome of religion, is that we take it upon ourselves. Not called to do it, not led to do it. We think this is the right thing to do, therefore we do it. They take it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Yeshua over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exercise you by the Yeshua whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Yeshua I know, and Paul I know. Why? Because they are known of God. But who are you? Scripture is clear that we are not supposed to be Christ followers, but Christ carriers, and that is what changes us from the inside out. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone is in covenant with God through Christ, he is a new creation. Something about you changes. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We are supposed to be transformed. This is the work of the Spirit of God in us. Romans chapter 8 verses 9 through 11. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. You're supposed to be a Christ carrier. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Yeshua from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life, release life in your body through his spirit who dwells in you. And it will change you. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world. Do not be like the rest of the folk going to church in this world. Do not just get the idea that you're going to live for God and live good and try to do your best and hope that God is pleased and takes you home. But be changed, be transformed, be metamorphosed by the renewing of your mind that you can prove that your life becomes proof that there is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God and you are living proof. There are five things that we need to grow up in, growing up in five critical ways. From faith, faith based, excuse me, from fact based to truth based, from self centered to Christ centered, from self powered to spirit powered, from fallen religious Christ follower to transformed Christ carrier, and from bios, limited natural being, to zoe unlimited spirit to a zoe unlimited spiritual being bios you would pronounce it bios but in greek it's bios and it is found in scripture to refer to us having existence whereas zoe is what god speaks of when he says that we should have life eternal life real life life to the full, the life that you can only get by being connected to the source of that life. And many of us are living for bios and living to extend our bios instead of living to come into and realize our zoe. We often misread the passage in John chapter 10. John chapter 10, beginning in verse 7, the Lord speaks to us about life and there are many people who quote this and do not even know what they are saying. 
John chapter 10, verses 7 through 11. Then, Je then Yeshua said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. You have to go through me. I am the access point to God. If anyone enters me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Because now you have access. You can go in and out and find pasture. But the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. First, I'm going to take what you have. Then I'm going to take the life out of who you are and what you have. Then I'm going to eradicate any evidence of your existence. That you come, and he said, that I have come, however, that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. And often we, we read that it goes on, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. That's critical. Because his life, when John says in him was life, and the life that was in him was the light of men. He's not just talking about existence. He's talking about eternal life. His life is eternal life. And often we read verse 10. We say, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. And we think that God is promising us abundant bias. I'm supposed to live here a long time. I'm supposed to live well. I'm supposed to have, you know, it's all about what God can do for me now. Let's take a closer look at this because that's actually not what it says. So in verse 10, the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life. The word is not bios. The word there is zoe. When it says that the shepherd gives his life for the sheep, the word there is zoe. God is not offering us you know, ha live longer, he's offering us eternal life. And if we take hold of the eternal life of God, and that's enough for us, the eternal life within us will not necessarily change the nature of bios that we live through, but it'll change us as we live through the bios around us. I want you to see the, the difference between living a bios, limited, natural existence and living a zoe, unlimited, spiritual existence. The zoe emanates from the inside out. The bios is the person who's living according to what's happening around them. A person who's living in bios, they're going to be bound instead of free. They're going to be lost where Zoe, the person who is set free and unlimited by Zoe, is at home with the Father. They are settled and secure with the Father. They are no longer an orphan. The person who is living a bias, natural existence, they, are, they have a darkened, worldly mind. But then the, the person who has a Zoe life within, they have an enlightened, renewed mind. The person living in bias is defeated and often driven by circumstances, whereas the Zoe person is victorious and living above circumstances. The Bios existence struggles with the flesh. The Zoe existence overcomes and walks in the spirit. The Bios life is fearful and full of fear. The Zoe life is faith-filled. The Bios life is stressed and worried. The Zoe life is overwhelmed by God's peace. The bios life is striving to be accepted and approved by God. The zoe life is living to honor and glorify an already accepting God. Because God is with me and because God is in me, I am free, I am secure with the Father, I am enlightened in my mind. I am victorious over my sick circumstances. I am overcoming and walking in spirit. I am filled with faith. I am overwhelmed by the peace of God, and I live for God's honor and glory, knowing 
that he has already accepted and approved of you. So what I've given you today are five critical ways that we should grow up. From fact-based to truth-based, from self-centered to Christ-centered, from self-powered to spirit-powered, from a fallen religious follower to a transformed spiritual Christ carrier, from living a bios limited as a bios limited natural being to a zoe unlimited spiritual being. And these are, we call this growing up in five critical ways that matter most. And the only question is, what are you going to do with it? So what should you do with what you've heard? Receive it. Believe it. Know it. Walk in it. It's application time. Receive it. Believe it. Know it. And walk in it. We call this the normal life cycle of a Christ carrier, part 10, from living small to living large. Father, we thank you for the word that you have given us. We thank you for allowing us to come together and to consider your word. We thank you, Father, for sharing it as only you can. We pray that that which has shared, been shared falls in good ground falls upon good ground and grows up 30, 60, no, even 100-fold, Lord. Let us be transformed under the power of your word. Let us come to the place where we are free. We thank you, Lord, that the truth we know, the truth we gnosko, makes us free. Whom the Son makes free, he is free indeed. We bless you, we honor you. Give you all glory. In the name of Yeshua, we be born. Amen. Hey, I hope that that was uh, ministered ministry to you today. I hope you were blessed by that. I hope that that spoke to you and helped you see in context how to grow up, how we need to grow up in five critical areas that really matter, five critical ways that we can grow up and need to grow up that really matter. For some of you, This should be a word of encouragement because you are already on the path. You are already growing. You can see God changing you in these ways. And today's message just gave explanation to what you're already experiencing. So be encouraged and keep on growing with the Lord and allow him to conform you to the image of his son. Thank you for tuning in to another life-changing message from Kingdom Life Community. If today's message blessed you, please like, comment, and subscribe. But most importantly, share. Share this message with your family, friends, coworkers, or anyone else you think needs to hear this word. You never know how it will impact them. We pray that you have a blessed week, and remember to live the kingdom life. We'll see you soon.